Thank you for watching the final presentation of Project Artemis. This presentation was prepared for AAE 450 spacecraft design. In the past, we have sent several missions to the moon, some manned and unmanned. Project Artemis is a feasibility study designed to test technology for a one-way mission to Mars. At the beginning of the course, we were provided with customer requirements that have guided our designs. We will have three colonies on the moon. The first is located at Shackleton Crater at the south pole of the moon. The second colony is on the far side of the moon. The last colony is located near a lunar skylight, a cave-in entrance to a lunar lava tube. Each colony will house eight middle-aged colonists or four married couples. These colonists will stay on the moon for four and two-sevenths years and explore the moon, collecting samples of lunar regolith and anorthosite to return to Earth. In addition to these requirements, we are trying to understand more about long-duration space missions. To do this, we are avoiding galactic and cosmic radiation by shielding our colonists. We are also observing colony cohesiveness to learn about the physical, emotional, and psychological effects of living away from Earth for an extended period of time. Finally, we are learning more about human health in a low-gravity environment. Crews have stayed on the International Space Station for six months at a time, but have never stayed multiple years in space. This is a challenge that has not been addressed. Finally, our overarching goal is to minimize our project cost. Our mission is broken into four main phases. Before we ever send anything to the moon, we need to make sure our technology is space rated. We expect research and development to take approximately eight years, and our first launch will be in 2022. First, we launch four communication satellites into orbit around the moon. This will take approximately six months. Next, we begin launching cargo payloads, our robots, rovers, and habitat modules to the moon. This process, in addition to construction time, will take about two years. Once everything is prepared, we are finally ready to send our crew for their four and two sevenths year stay on the moon. We launch our communication satellites on board a Minotaur launch vehicle. This vehicle directly places our communication satellites into L1, L2, and polar orbits around the moon. L1 and L2 are equilibrium points in space between the Earth and Moon, and on the opposite side of the Moon. The L1 satellite provides communication support to the Skylight base, and the L2 satellite provides support to the Far Side base. Our satellites and vehicles work in tandem to provide communication support between the Earth and the Moon. The red lines indicate optical laser communication, and the light blue lines are radio frequency, or RF communication. Stationary objects on the Moon use laser communication for higher data rates, and the moving vehicles use RF due to pointing inaccuracies. Now that our communications network is established around the Moon, we send our cargo to the Moon on board NASA's Space Launch System, the SLS. This system is one currently in development. The SLS is capable of delivering 130 tons to low Earth orbit, or LEO. We use the SLS to launch our cargo transport vehicle into LEO. The cargo transport vehicle is broken into three main sections. The booster stage has five ion thrusters that transfer the vehicle from LEO to low lunar orbit, LLO, on a low thrust spiral trajectory. We will describe this trajectory more on the following slide. 
The cargo pod contains our payload. The cargo transport vehicle is capable of landing 25 tons on the lunar surface at one time. Once we arrive in LLO, we jettison the booster stage and use a conventional chemical propulsion lander stage to land our cargo on the moon. We travel on the low thrust spiral trajectory to deliver our payload from LEO to LLO. Near the Earth, there are many spirals close together and they grow larger as time continues. We use a lunar insertion maneuver to transition from spiraling away from the Earth to spiraling into the Moon. Once we are sufficiently close to the Moon, we are able to jettison the booster stage and land our cargo on the Moon. Once our cargo is safely landed on the moon, we use a construction robot, the scissor lift, to safely lower the cargo pod to the lunar surface. All of our cargo pods are on rails that transfer between the lander stage and the rails on the scissor lift. Another construction robot we use on the moon is the bulldozer robot. The bulldozer robot is a teleoperated robot complete with a bulldozer scoop, backhoe arm, and robotic arms. The bulldozer robot is responsible for towing cargo pods and other payload, excavating sites for habitat modules and checkpoint shelters, general assembly tasks, and for emergency situations. We also have the Regolith Transport Robot to assist with construction responsibilities. The Regolith Transport Robot refines the rough chunks of Regolith into finer grains. We use this finer material for shielding in our heavy, pressurized rovers. To prepare our habitat sites, our bulldozer robots first excavate the site, digging into the lunar surface. Next, we place carbon fiber arch structures to support the lunar regolith on top used for shielding. Next, our bulldozer robots cover the support with regolith to provide radiation shielding. Lastly, the bulldozer robot tows the habitat modules into the newly prepared habitat site. Inside the carbon fiber arch structure, we have our habitat modules. We have two modules that make up the crew habitat, the recreation module and the living module. Each module weighs approximately 19 tons and is 8.4 meters high. The living module is broken into two floors. The upper floor has the bathrooms and bedrooms for the colonists. The lower floor has other living amenities such as the dining area, the living room area, and additional storage area. The recreation module is broken into three major parts. The center is the recreation area where residents can play badminton, basketball, foot volley, or any other sport they invent during their time on the moon. The orange exercise area has traditional exercise equipment, such as cycles, treadmills, and a climbing wall for the crew to keep up their strength while on the moon. The area shown in purple is the aeroponics bay an area for the crew to grow fresh food to supplement any freeze-dried food the crew eats. Now that the habitat modules are set up and the colony is prepared, it is time to send the crew. To do this, we use the Crew Transfer Vehicle, or CTV. The CTV is broken into five major pieces. Starting from the bottom right of the image, we have the Service Module First Stage. This is responsible for delivering the crew to LLO. The service module second stage has propellant for the return trip home after four and two seventh years. The crew resides in the Artemis crew capsule for trips to and from the moon. Finally, the crew lands on the lunar surface in the Artemis crew lunar lander and uses the ascent stage to return home. Looking at the initial mass of the CTV, we see that we fit our mass constraints, but we are unable to launch the CTV in one launch because it is 30 meters tall. 
To send our crew to the moon, we must dock portions of the CTV in LEO. We start by using a series of burns to dock the Artemis crew lunar lander with the crew capsule. Next, we dock our first stage of the service module. Once complete, we are able to transfer to the moon. We have mentioned our colony several times but have yet to discuss their exact locations. The Skylight Colony is located near a lunar skylight on the near side of the moon. The Shackleton Colony is located on the sunlit rim of Shackleton Crater at the south pole of the moon. Our last colony is located on the far side of the moon. When the crew arrives in LLO, the lander detaches from the crew capsule and service module second stage which stays in orbit. These two pieces of the CTV stay in orbit for the four and two sevenths years to provide emergency support to each colony. Once the crew is on the moon, they explore and travel on the moon in pressurized rovers. We maintain that the crew is in a shirt sleeve environment for as long as possible and that we use our spacesuits in emergency situations only. The heavy pressurized rover is one of two vehicles we use to traverse the lunar surface. It is a short-range shielded vehicle with a maximum range of approximately 100 kilometers. At launch on Earth, the rover is approximately 17 tons, but is almost 49 tons fully operational with shielding. It has the capability of retrieving lunar samples and storing them to return to Earth. In the case of an emergency, we can use the heavy pressurized rover to rescue two stranded crew members. The second vehicle we use to explore the moon is a light pressurized rover. The major difference between the heavy pressurized rover and this one is that the light pressurized rover is not a shielded vehicle. We travel between checkpoints to rest and recharge. The maximum range in this vehicle is 1,500 kilometers, significantly larger than the range of the heavy rover. We construct checkpoint shelters using empty cargo pods as a support structure. Regolith is placed on top of the cargo pod as support and shielding for the colonists inside. We use these rovers for various exploratory missions. Starting with the image on the left, we have Shackleton Crater. Shackleton Crater is a large impact crater at the south pole of the moon. Parts of the crater lie in eternal darkness and have never seen sunlight. We explore various areas of the crater and gather samples to return to Earth. The image on the right is the skylight entry to a lunar lava tube. Lava tubes are a promising location as they provide a naturally shielded environment for our crew. To explore inside the lava tube, we need a system to get in and out of the skylight safely. To do this, we develop the skylight repel system. This system uses four harnesses to suspend our light rover in place and carefully lowers the rover inside the lava tube. At the far side base, we conduct radio interferometry. Radio interferometers are big telescopes gathering RF data from deep space. Our array consists of 300 individual stations randomly deployed in Kulik Crater. On the right side of the slide, we see the process of unfolding and installing one station. We do this using the light rover. All measurements are processed and sent to the central correlator. The correlator sends this data to the communication satellite at L2, which then returns the information back to Earth. For all those samples we collect, we use a science sample carrier system to return samples in 250 kilogram increments. Each colony is outfitted with four rockets for their time on the moon. For the four and two sevenths years on the moon, the crew will not have enough supplies to last. To remedy the issue, we send three resupply missions per colony every year after the first one and two sevenths years. We don't send one at the four and two sevenths year mark as it is time to return home. We resupply food, water, oxygen, habitat supplies, repair supplies for rovers and habitats, etc. 
Once the four and two sevenths years are up, it is time to return home. To do this, we launch from the lunar surface in the ascent stage to LLO. Here, we dock with the orbiting crew capsule in second stage. We then jettison the ascent stage and return to Earth. Our entry, descent, and landing maneuvers are similar to that of Apollo. We enter the atmosphere at a shallow angle and slow down using a heat shield. We deploy two drogue parachutes to slow us down enough to deploy three main parachutes. We splash down in the Pacific Ocean where we are rescued by ground crews. Once all is said and done, the final price tag on Project Artemis is about $550 billion, roughly 3.5 times the cost of Apollo. If we split this cost over a 15-year mission, we would require about $36.5 billion per year. This cost is twice NASA's current budget, so this is a little infeasible. However, if we send only one colony, each can be sent independently of the others. The cost is much lower. One individual colony costs about $280 billion, or roughly half the total cost of the mission. You might wonder why one colony, one-third of the mission, costs half as much and not one-third as much. When we send all three colonies, we can take advantage of the economy of scale. We're building and launching duplicate vehicles and the unit cost is lower when we build more. So, when we build and launch fewer vehicles, the unit cost increases. If we split the $280 billion over a 15-year project, the cost comes out to about $18.5 billion per year, which is nearly identical to NASA's current budget. Our overall probability of mission success is 80%. We define mission success as a probability of successfully completing every objective and requirement for the mission. For example, if a science sample carrier rocket fails, this is a mission failure. We also have a crew mission return of 83%. This is initially startling, but makes sense considering the scope of our mission. Something on this scale has yet to be attempted, and we are unsure of the risks involved with living on the moon. Thank you for watching the final presentation of Project Artemis. We hope you enjoyed learning about our project. More information about our project is available on the course website. Thank you.